So, ladies and gentlemen, we were looking at uh, the first three out of five parts of the ironic blessing. My my colleague who's in the room behind, he said, it sounds like ironic blessing. <laughs> and uh, so he wanted to comment on the on the Facebook, ironic, the ironic blessing. There's a part of it that's really funny and true. This is a bit ironic, especially ironic if we read it from a Greek perspective, but it's very much not that if we read it from an Hebraic perspective. So um, I'm quickly going to read it, how it's written in the TS-98. Number six, um, uh, starting in verse 22, and Yahweh spoke to Moshe saying, speak to Aharon and his son saying, this is how you bless the children of Israel. Say to them, Yahweh shall bless and guard you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you and show favor to you. Yahweh lift up his face to you and give you peace. And then verse 27, which is really interesting. And you'll see that Jeff Penner, and we're going to look at two more of his videos tonight, but he, he, he places quite a bit of emphasis on this verse 27. Thus, they shall put my name on the children of Israel and I myself shall bless them. And the whole idea is how do you place the name of God on anybody except if maybe that sentence means something else in Hebrew. And we've looked at it. You can only place the name of God on something or on somebody or on a group of people. If you understand that from an Hebraic perspective, your name refers to your character. The word Shem in Hebrew, which is the word for name, comes in the middle of the word Neshema, which is your breath or your character. So this really says, you shall place my character on the people. In other words, you shall bestow on them what I've revealed to you about myself. And in this way, you shall be a blessing to them. All right. And how and what is this blessing? Well, it's the verses that goes before that from verse 23. Um, Yahweh bless and keep you. He make his face shine upon you. He show favor to you. Yahweh lift up his face upon you and he give you peace. And this five part series of uh, Jeff Penner's work is giving us an explanation of how our Greek thinking is stifling us into very abstract and very philosophical concepts where in from an Hebraic perspective, it really is just one amazing revelation of uh, what God wants us to know, what, um, what Yahweh wants us to know about his character. And thus, when we get to verse 27 and he says, thus you, the Kohenim, you, the priest, you will place the name of Yahweh on the people. He, was, he is referring to this revelation of Yahweh's character. Um, in the previous verses. So without further ado, we're going to jump into the fourth part. If you have not seen part one to three, kindly just check on our YouTube channel. Um, they are up there, or you can just go straight search the ironic blessing part one, two, or three, and the Jeff Benner's video will come up first. So let's see if the share screen works. Just be, oh, there's another thing. Genesis 1, 2, um, the Ruach Elohim, the wind of Elohim, hovered over the panim of the waters, the face or the surface of the waters. Here's an interesting verse that uses this word, panim. Exodus 33:14, And he said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. They say that the translators use the word presence there from panim. Why didn't they just put face there like it says, and he said, my face will go with you. Well, they don't do that because that wouldn't make any sense to us. You see, English translations are written so that it makes perfect sense to a Greek thinker. So they remove all the Hebraisms, all the Hebrew concepts, they remove them, and they plug in Greek concepts so that Greek thinkers can understand the Bible. The problem is they're understanding it from a Greek perspective and then not from the Hebraic perspective. But literally it says, my face will go with you. Interestingly, prior to this, Yahweh says to Moshe, I'm fed up with you guys. I'm completely fed up. I'm not going to go with you into the land. You guys have to go on your own. I just, I'm not gonna, if I go with you, I'm going to kill you. So Yahweh emphatically states, he's not. but then he says, here in verse 14, he says, but I will send my face with you. Well, that's very interesting. What does that mean? See, in Hebraic thought, if, if a person represents another person, they represent his presence, his face. So, somebody else is going to lead the people, and this, this person is the face of Yahweh. What does it say in Exodus 33, also in this very same chapter? Uh, it says that Moshe spoke with Yahweh face to face as though a man speaking with his friend. 
And then ten verses later, it's, Yahweh says, nobody can see my face or they die. What's going on here? No one can see God's face. Moshe can't see God's face, but then he sees God's face. There's somebody else involved here. Unfortunately, nowhere in the Bible does it actually come out and define these things. The way I like to understand it is the wholeness of being, the wholeness of that person is their face. When you're having a conversation with somebody, you're looking at their face. You don't look at their toes. You don't look at their feet. You look at their face because that's their essence. That's who they are, and so that's the wholeness of their being. You can really read an entire person through their face, through their eyes, their mouth, their, their facial expressions, etc. The next word we're going to take a look at is, it says in the, uh, the Aaronic Blessing, to make shine. If you put a yod in front of a verb, what does it mean? That's right, he, exactly. He makes shine, ya, ya er. And it's written in the causative form. We mentioned the causative form. It means not just he shines, but he causes to shine, or he makes shine. That's the Hebrew word or, the verb. Light and darkness are oftentimes equated together. or uh, Not equated, but antonyms. They're the opposites. In Hebraic thought, light is order, and darkness is chaos. In the beginning... God made the light, or he brought about the light. Why? If you walk into a darkened room and you're going to go to work, what do you got to do? You got to turn the lights on. You can't see without it. So the light, lights bring about order. Darkness brings about chaos. Okay, here's the verse I was uh, mentioning a, a minute ago. It has this word, to give light. This is in 1 Samuel 14, verse 29. Then said Jonathan, My father hath troubled the land. See, I pray you, how mine eyes have been enlightened. That's the same verb here, or, to give, to, to shine. Here it's understood as to enlighten, to, to give light, to bring about order. Because I tasted a little of this honey. In other words, he ate this honey. Here's another verse that shows that there's something about honey. I ate a little of this honey, and now my eyes are opened. I understand now. I have enlightenment. Okay, the word or, interestingly, has this meaning of order, and is in our word order. Notice the word or in the word order. It's also, the word order has the word or the root dor, dur, or dar in it, dalet resh. Dalet resh in, in Hebrew is the, the door is the generations. Uh, in Hebraic thought, the gener a generation is a circle, and it's also an idea of order. Some other words that mean order is seder. Notice the door in there as well. Seder. That means an arrangement, like the sidur. The sidur is the prayer book. It's an arrangement of prayers. The Passover seder, same word. Slightly different vowel pointings. That's a, an arrangement for the service of the Passover. Another one is davar or daber. There's the door again, but with a bet in the middle of it. What is davar? What is devorah? Devar is word. What's devorah? Devorah is simply the feminine form of davar. Deborah is the name. Remember, every name is a Hebrew word. Exactly. It's a bee or bees. Devorah is bees. What about this one? Midvar. It's got the word Devar with a mit in front of it. What is Midvar? The wilderness. All right. What do all these have in common? They're all order. Words are an arrangement of words that are ordered in a way to make a sentence. Bees, their colony is so perfectly ordered. So that's why the word Devarah comes from the root, devar, or the idea of bees comes from Devarah. And then wilderness is a place of order. It's in perfect harmony with each other. It's only when man intervenes his will in nature that things get messed up. Nature by itself always maintains an equilibrium and is in perfect harmony, perfect order. God took them out of the cities and took them where? To the wilderness. When he brought Israel out of Egypt, where did he take them? To the wilderness. When Yeshua wanted to pray, where did he go? The wilderness, to the mountains. The wilderness is a, is, is a perfect place. And I've heard it before. This is my church. People talking about the forest, they say this. Well, there's a lot of truth to that. Because God teaches us through the wilderness. It's where he 
is best understood because Yahweh is in perfect order, the wilderness is in perfect order, and the wilderness is created by Yahweh, it makes perfect sense. Literally means to illuminate, to bring about order. That's the meaning of this word. Hanan is the, uh, in, the Hebrew for the word gracious. Behind the word gracious. Gracious is another one of these abstract words. Don't like the abstract words because we, don't, we can't get the, the meaning behind the Hebrew there. Okay, what is Hanan? Proverbs 5.19 says, A lovely doe, a graceful goat. The word graceful is the word chen, which is the root of Hanan. Chen is the root to Hanan. They're, they're almost identical in meaning. Again, grace and favor, these are abstracts. Even graceful, graceful is a little bit better as far as a concrete because a graceful goat, a lovely doe and a graceful goat. If you've ever watched goats or deer as they jump, they're very graceful as they race through the forest. This is the, a little bit more of the concrete. It's a beautiful thing to see. So the idea behind this is a sight to behold would be a really good way to explain that. A sight to behold. Something that's beautiful. Okay. Um, he, he drifted a little bit off, but his point is if, if you want to explain what it means to that God makes his face shine on you and you sit with this concept of light and darkness and light being connected to order, it literally means to illuminate, um, uh, to illuminate in order to bring order. Okay. Does it make sense? I know uh, uh, some of what he's going into, he's, he's expecting or is assuming that uh, one do understand a little bit of Hebrew, but um, is there any questions before we jump to the fifth part? Any questions, any remarks? No. Okay. Sit back tight. We go to part five. Also comes from this word chen or chanan is the word mechana. Anybody know what mechana means? It's a place of gracefulness. Mechana is the camp. Remember when uh, Jacob set up camp on the other side of the river before he went to go Esau, and he placed the, he called the place mechana is the camp. So the camp is related to this idea of gracefulness. You're a shepherd, you've been out you know, for days at a time, weeks at a time, you're tired, you're cold, you're hungry, you're starving, you're lonely. You come over the rise and you see the fires of the camp. That feeling that you get, that's hen. You see, the, the ancient Hebrews were very emotional people. Their emotions were very important to them. So a lot of Hebrew words are actually related to emotion. That's a concrete concept, the way you feel about something. So this idea of coming over the rise and seeing the camp and what floods over you, relief. There I have love, friendship, companionship, food, sustenance, all of this idea. This is the idea of Hanan. To translate this word as gracious with a very Greek abstract way just really falls short of it, whereas I prefer to understand it as this idea of love, sustenance, and friendship. Now the word Hen is probably the root to our word home. I mean, it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Even mechana, which uh, means camp, is comes from chen, and chen is probably the origin of our word home. It says in the English translations, if I have found favor in your eyes, O Lord, when like Noah or Moshe is speaking to Yahweh. In other words, if you look at, if Yahweh, if you can look at me and you can see a friend, Somebody that you can have fellowship with. That's what this word means. The next word is to lift up. That's Nasa Nun Samach Aleph. 
this is also sometimes written with the letter sin. Uh, it's written both ways in the Hebrew Bible. That's the shin, but with the dot over on the left-hand side. Anyway, it's pronounced nasa, and it means to lift up. Really not too much I can say about this word other than I think it's very interesting. And by the way, don't anybody say that I'm teaching this because I think it's just a coincidence that the word, the Hebrew word nasa means to lift up. It is really kind of similar to NASA, which is to lift up rockets. I just, I just find it very ironic. I thought it was kind of cool. Let's move on to the next word, which is the word seem. Yeah, the word seem is translated as to give here in the Aaronic Blessing. But literally what this word means is to set something in place. In other words, to, to cause it to be established and firm, to, to firmly set something in place. The next word that we're going to get into is the word peace. Now the peace is another abstract word that usually means to us, most of us are pretty familiar with this word shalom, but do we really understand what it means? Usually we understand peace or shalom as, as absence of strife or war. But that's not really the meaning of this. Let's go back to the root, the verbal root of this word. Exodus 21:34. The owner of the pit shall make restitution, giving money to its owner, but keeping the dead animal. Here we have the, the root word to shalom, which is shalom. Shalom. And that's translated here as to make restitution. What does restitution have to do with peace? We have to understand that shalom literally means to restore something back to its original state. In other words, if I'm missing something, I'm not shalom. In order to become shal to have shalom, I have to restore whatever it is that I'm missing. The verb shalom means to restore. The noun shalom means to to have restoration, to have everything brought back to completeness, to wholeness. Yes, exactly, to be whole, to be complete. Now we use the phrase Shabbat Shalom all the time, but do we really understand what we're saying Hebraically? Now but from a Hebraic perspective, what you're really saying is, is that you're tired because you've been working all week. You're drained. And today is the Shabbat, and you need to be restored. So may your Shabbat restore you is literally what they're saying. May the Shabbat bring about wholeness and completeness for you. That's what Shabbat Shalom literally means from a Hebraic perspective. In Psalms 122, verse 6, it says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. When we hear that, we usually think of peace in the context of absence of strife and war, which, yeah, that's a good thing, and that is part of shalom, but it's not all of it. They need to be restored. Is Jerusalem restored? No. What's Jerusalem missing? A king. That's one. There's more. Moshiach. There's two. Order, exiles regathered, that's good. There's one more that I'm thinking of here, the Torah, that's a good one. It's missing the Torah. It's a very secular nation right now. There's one more thing that's missing, one key component of Jerusalem. There it is, the temple. That's it, that's right, the temple. When we say pray for the peace of Jerusalem, what we're really saying is, is pray that Jerusalem be, is restored to its original position, to where it is now whole, where it will be whole and complete, including the king, the Mashiach, the temple, order, the Torah, all of these things. Interestingly, in Hebrew, the way this is, is uh, pronounced, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, is Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. This is beautiful Hebrew poetry. Notice the shawl and the shil in, you know, throughout this phrase. It's a, it, Hebrew loves to put words together that sound alike, which is why it's written this way. Sha'alu shalom Yerushalayim. A lot of people ask, what does Jerusalem mean? Well, Yeru, it's two words. Yeru means to point out the way, literally to teach. And then shalom means completeness. So what does Yerushalayim mean? Teach completeness or point out the way to restoration. Yahweh, he who exists, will kneel before you presenting gifts and will guard you with a hedge of protection. 
Yahweh will illuminate the wholeness of his being towards you, bringing order, and he will provide you with love, sustenance, and friendship. Yahweh will lift up and carry his wholeness of being toward you, and he will set in place all you need to be whole and complete. To me, when you understand these words from Hebraic perspective, the words just come to life. And completely new revelations come up there. If you can do this with any study, with any sentence, any verse in the Bible, and you're going to find nuggets like this. It's just totally amazing. Yevarechecha Yahweh vayishmarecha Ya'er Yahweh panav alecha v'chunecha Yisa Yahweh panav alecha v'yasim lecha shalom All right. Um, just quickly going to share the screen with you again. Um, let's just share this one. Just a second. Um, preview. All right. Yahweh will kneel before you presenting gifts and he will guard you with a hedge of protection. Um, Yahweh will illuminate the wholeness of his being towards you and bring you order and he will provide you with love, sustenance and friendship, which is the whole understanding behind the, the concept of being gracious. Um, and then Yahweh will lift up and carry the wholeness of his being. Normally the translation says his countenance or his face towards you and he will set in place, see him all you need uh, to be whole and complete. Um, this is a whole different sounding um, almost write up than we find in the Bible. And again, like we've said so many times, not that the translators is trying to misguide us or mislead us, but the problem is that the translators deal with a mainly Greek thinking audience. And some of the choices of words need to fall into this whole Greek thinking mindset. But the sadness of it, we miss all of this. Instead of the saying Yahweh will bless you, it means that Yahweh will go on his knees before you. Yevarechcha um, uh, is the Hebrew there. He will go on his knees and present you with a gift, and then he will guard you with a hedge of protection, which is the Hebrew word shamar. And literally, like we've seen last week, shamar is when a shepherd bring his um, sheep into a into a pen. And then in order to protect them in this little stone pen, he would like dress the top of the walls with thorns. And these thorns would then keep out uh, predators and even other, other people who could steal the animals. And the shepherd himself would guard the ent entrance. And this is this whole concept of Yahweh will, will, will bless you, but he will then also keep you. He will protect you by putting in place that which is needed for you to be safe with him. Okay, next sentence, Yahweh will illuminate the wholeness of his being towards you and he will bring order and will provide you with love, sustenance, sustenance and friendship. Again, this is one of the most difficult things in, um, um, oh wait, I just need to quickly get out here. How do I stop sharing that? This is one of the most difficult concepts is this whole idea of favor and grace. Probably the most hollow ridden concept in the modern church is this whole concept of grace. But once you start looking at the Hebraic concept behind grace, you find this whole um, gen, um, Chet Nun, which is a outer wall that continues. If you take the pictures for Chen, you have a, literally a wall and then you have seed, which represents an outer wall that continues. In one of his other videos, Jeff explains, and he touched briefly on it, um, when you have a nomadic camp and you have all the separate families, individual tents, and it's rigged together and it forms almost like a, an outer shield against the wilderness and against the wild and against pirates and against whatever, that whole continuous wall was understood as the chen. It repre literally represented safety and a household, household. And when you would then put a mem in front of it, you get the word machanan, which is what the Bible translates to a camp. But literally, when you have a mem in front of a, a noun, you, you talk about the participle form, okay? It's a place of. For example, the word davar, when you put a mem in front, it becomes meat bar, and meat bar is a place of order. Same with this thing. Chen with a, a, a mem in front becomes mechanan, and this means a place of safety representing the household. And this, in all terms, is a home. So basically what Yahweh said, Yahweh will bring order, and he will bring you into his home. 
you know, and, and, and what's difficult about this concept, especially for us Greek thinking individuals, we want to serve God, but we want to be almost also be free from anything that represents any form of order in his household. Ironically, isn't it? We want to say, yes, we're in Christ and we're free. It's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Uh, Galatians 5 verse 1, one of the most also quoted out of context verses. But what we don't like is to say that when God brings us into his household, he also brings us into his canopy, his chupa, where there's order. You know, he's, we can have his safety for sure when we come into his household, but are we ready to accept that when we're in God's household, the household runs according to how he sets it out. Very often we don't like that. We, we want to be in God's household. Oh yeah, for sure. And we want to call it and we want to call it grace, but we don't want God to tell us what to do. <laughs> Super ironically. Anyhow, and this uh, very last one, let's just quickly look at that, showing the screen again. Um, and Yahweh will lift up and carry his wholeness of being. Again, that's the word for face, panim. And he will set seam in place all you need to be whole and complete. And again, we so love the idea and he will give you peace. But then what on earth is the meaning of peace? Um, and when you look at it from an Hebraic perspective, I mean, he's just nailed it. The verb shalom, which is to restore something unto, is the backbone of the word shalom, which ironically we translate as peace, but it is a restoration unto something it's bringing us back this is why we have the shabbat this is why we have um all the festivals this is why we have the seventh year the shemitah this is why you have the year of jubilee all of those biblical concepts is to restore us back unto a place which meant the or was the original intention of yahweh okay and so beautiful we, and like he said when we pray for the peace of jerusalem we actually just pray for the restoration of jerusalem back unto God, back unto what God meant it to be. Okay. Oh, sorry, I'm a bit um And then he quoted Shalu Shalom Mirushalim, Psalm 122, which is just a beautiful word place with all the shins, Shalu Shalom Mirushalim. Um and, and also the word Jerusalem, when what what we very often forget is Jerusalem literally means a place from which God radiates his um, order and radiates his instructions and radiates his his good directions for the path. Um, a completely different poem. And, and, and like we looked at it last week, when we now look at verse 27, which follows this and says, in this way, you will place the character of Yahweh on the people. You will basically go and demonstrate to the people what was the intention of Yahweh. And you, and you, read, um, and you read this text and say, Yahweh will kneel before you. He will present you with a gift. He will guard you with a hedge of protection. He will illuminate the wholeness of his being towards you. He will bring you order. He will provide you with everything that you need the whole concept of household and then he will lift you up and he will carry the wholeness of his being towards you and he will set everything in place for you to be whole and complete is that not insanely incredible giving us a summary of the character of yahweh because we very often you know we've touched on it last week um exodus 22 when it says do not uh, take the name of the lord your god in vain literally it says there in from an hebraic perspective do not misrepresent yahweh so when you go out and you say look i'm a christian i follow jesus are you are we understanding what we mean of that because we literally walk around with a mantle of saying we represent yahweh we represent what he says of himself and uh, I hope whenever we read uh, Numbers 6, 23, 24, 25, that we will remember that God gives us a, such a beautiful um, little um, shimmer into his character. And what, what is expected of us is to go out and live this. First of all, we need to embrace this for ourselves. I mean, maybe that's the first complicated thing because I think it's so difficult to actually just accept that God is good and he's good and he wants to be good towards us. Because once we accept that and once we can embrace that, it becomes easier to say, well, now I can go out and go live God towards the world, go demonstrate into the world, go radiating um, towards the world. Um, and this, my friends, is the summary of the ironic blessing, not the ironic blessing, the ironic blessing. Okay, floor open. Any questions, any suggestions, anything that struck you? Let's rock and roll. 
Chantal, I can see you want to speak, but you feel scum. <laughs> I talk way too much. <laughs> no, no you, you're, 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 really the ice, to, you're the, uh, you're the icebreaker. You can speak up. Anybody, anything that stood out for you? Anything that you want to comment on? Any questions? I mean, like I always say, I have no answers, but a good question is much better than a good answer, right? <laughs> like, do you think, like, when when he says, when he restores us, oh, my hair, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> when he restores us to, to our original being, um, do you think that means, like, the state we were in before the sin, before, like, before the sin fell, of the sin fell, the sin fell. Before the sin fell. <laughs> the, nice one. Day. Okay, before the um, sin came into the world and um, kind of ruined everything for everyone, um, and and everything kind of came under the curse of sin. That that as you, because there's a psalm as well where David says he restores him to the original state of being. I think that was the actual. Um, it actually says so. So maybe it's restoring us to that original design. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. What do you think? Uh, it's, no, it's it's. Um, obviously, I always have comments to, to give, and not necessarily answers. But my comment would be that this is the central message of all of the prophets, including Yeshua was turn back to God. In other words, there, 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 there seems to exist an ideal state that was the intention. And all of the prophets call everybody throughout all generations, return to God, Teshuvah, return to him. So the whole idea that what God, God wants to give us restoration. Um, okay, so restoration, obviously one needs to unpack. The word shalom does not mean to turn back. That's the word shuv. Shalom means to restore you unto wholeness. You have to kind of complete the sentence. God is not just into returning us. You have to clarify. When you use the word shalom, which is so thinly translated as peace, one I have to say that the intention of the character of Yahweh is to bring us back to a state of being complete. That is what he's wanting to do with us all the time in other words six days you work on the seventh day you return you rebreathe you become human again you become filled again with his breath with his spirit that sense of restoration is the heart of yahweh so restoration yes but you have to say restoration unto wholeness because that's actually the complete meaning of shalom although the word shalom means the process of turning back shalom is a noun form that says a, a, a turning back unto wellness Yamar. And I'm, I'm talking too much. Okay, the very good question. Uh, anybody else? Hello, Kerry. I can see, also see that you're burned to say something. <laughs> oh, sorry. I don't. I know my customers not not that well. <laughs> anybody else? Any anything that struck you from this? Anything? Any comment? Otherwise, tonight will be very quick. It's a, it's a great time to, to talk about uh, returning to God. How since we are uh, heading in, into the new month of Elul, right? Okay. Hebrew calendar. Yeah. So it's very, indeed, it's very good to. <laughs> so you Pretty, you tell that. Say, say again. Right. So you, you, you so you're you're saying that the you think that the church should, should turn back to God somehow, like obeying the God's word. That what you're trying to say um yes absolutely the, what i'm saying is this this the central theme of a nation being rescued which is what this is the the underlying narrative of the entire bible god is constantly busy restoring us to the state before adam and eve decided that they will decide for themselves <laughs> the, the the whole biblical narrative is gently turning us back and you know it plays out in in so many epochs and with so much drama and with so much detail and all of the detail helps us to understand just how fallen humans are when they decide for themselves so i, I think i think the central narrative is constantly the inv it's it's almost not just a restoration it's an invitation to turn back god is not forcing this on the, onto anybody okay. he's giving us space to choose a return to him that's why the prophet said return unto god return unto god return again that is the narrative all, all the time so now 
Fred, you're touching on a beautiful point. Next week, we're going to look at, we need to look at the, at the festivals next week because now in, in the month of September, we start getting back, start entering or getting closer to the month of Tishri. The month of Elul is the sixth month on the Hebrew calendar. It is understood to be the month of humanity. And in Hebraic understand humanity or six is always a very evil number. <laughs> Not because humans are evil, but just because humans are not that interested in God. <laughs> we think we are, but we're not. We're very much interested in ourselves. And we're very much interested in allowing our egos to drive us. So the month of Elul is understood from the sages in the Jewish community as the month where you, you come to the end of your rope. You come to the end of your humanity. This is where you kind of discover that in yourself, there's not an, not an ability to help yourself <laughs> you need to be helped <laughs> we need to say yes to god's invitation to be for us to be rescued and then the seventh month which is the month of tishri which is the month of uh, we know that the seventh month is all about unfulfilled festivals this is the month which celebrates or rather that looks forward to the return of Mas messiah this is the month looking at the wedding chupa the uh, yom kippur and it's, it's also the month um looking forward to Yeshua living amongst us in the Messianic kingdom. So, yes, we are entering the month of Elul. I'm not exactly sure. I need to check the calendar, it's, but it's coming up now, which is the month that it is okay if the sixth month kind of challenge you. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow afternoon begins, starts. Really? When, Wednesday, Wednesday uh, sunsets. Yeah. Oh, the, wow. The Freddy, first, thank first you. That you for, for Elul. Uh, I'm quickly just going to check on my calendar as well. I've got it up here. Uh, let me just get the Hebrew. Yeah. Oh, it starts on uh, Thursday evening, actually. Oh, uh, it's Thursday? Thursday evening at sunset starts the month of Elul. So Friday is what they call the first day yes, of Elul. Yes, yes, you, you were. Okay, so well, what, what happened? Let's see. Yeah, it's. The, yeah. yeah, you're right. Yeah. Okay, so so very from my point of view, I never spiritual over spiritualize these things. I think the danger is that you then make a new religion of the months and stuff. But I think just on the point of returning, God has this whole twelve month system and it repeats so that it's in, built into this whole circular mindset and into this generational mindset is the concept of returning always built into a seven day week is six days of work and a seventh day of restoration returning back to our original state of wellness um likewise with the months and the festivals and the seven years and the jubilees and everything there's the sense of re restoration and returning all the time but like i said is ca caution not to spiritualize things and read into meaning that may not be there it's, it's more of being it's more a matter of being aware I've, I've noted that, that a lot of times in September, it feels like September never ends. <laughs> Very often when you're like if confronted with, Elul normally falls in September. And very often it goes like, man, September, it feels like September never ends. Isn't there a song like that by one or other rock band? <laughs> Green Day. Green Day. When's September it? never ends. That's right. Okay. But thank you, Freddie. Yeah, and God, by the way, next week, Tuesday, God willing, we will look at, uh, we're going to just chat about the festivals again. We need to talk about that a couple of times every year when these festivals come up. But I want us to look at the festivals and even spend a couple of weeks looking at it because it is important to Yahweh. He makes so much mention of it. And that's the fact that, that as Christians, we've just thrown it all out the window. We miss out on so much of the beautiful detail that God invites us to uh, participate in. And, you know, the, the Bible call it um, mikras, um, very often translated as festivals, but a mikra is a dress rehearsal. It's, it's a place of calling out. And the, and the Jews understand that as a place where you literally come together, like let's say you do a musical and where you come to prepare for the real deal and you have your, your attire and everything in place and, the, and all your songs. And, you know, the, the Hebrew uses the word mikra, which literally means like a dress rehearsal. God invites us into repeating this as many times as we can in our lives because it's important to him. And there is stuff to learn. There is stuff that he wants us to, you know, understand. Okay, lekker. Yes, Ziggy? 
No, no, no. Avi wanted to say something. <laughs> Avi. <laughs> <laughs> um, the floor is yours. Like, <laughs> I'm still busy formulating the question, but um, my mind likes to go to practical <laughs> sense. So if I can ask this, with the whole thing of shalom and returning to God in order to be restored and that whole process on a practical level, what does participation in that stage actually look like? Uh, what, uh, just just, uh, just explain to me what stage you're talking of, participating like, in, what, in what stage? The, the, basically just the participation of returning to God and being restored. Is there a, um, a part that you, know, you plunge yourself into and you dedicatedly you know, do something as part of the restoration? process very deep question um i think <laughs> I, th I think throughout the ages in fact in all religions there is almost an innate pull towards rituals and a, a, a pull towards doing things repeatedly patterns that helps you remember that helps you keep the stuff that you really feel strong about intact in your life now, in every religion, you can put your magnifying glass on top of that, and you will find rituals everywhere. You find rites of passages, you find fucking whatever. But in the Bible, um, God has, has a number of things that seems to that He seems to value. Um, he seems to He seems to value day and night, where night represents sleep and day represents striving and working. Then it seems that every seventh day He invites us, as part of the seven day cycle, to rebreathe. Okay, that's something that we seem to be invited to participate simply because God said he gave that day a different function. We, we use the word holy, kadosh, um, but the word kadosh is so politically and spiritually and churchy loaded. We don't like it. We don't like the word holy. It's, 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 it feels pious to us, but holy in Hebrew literally means that it's a different, a different function. Okay, there's an interesting word. The word kadesh in Hebrew means a prostitute. Okay, now you go like, whoa, 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 holy and the prostitute. What? That's because the word holy means somebody is diff something or some body is different. And the word Kadesh means this function that this person has is different than what it should be. Kadesh, it's interesting. Same, you almost spell it exactly the same. You use the same Hebrew letters, it's just got a different vowel points. So, but the seventh day is Kadosh, it's given a different function. Okay, and, the, and in the same way, you look at the festivals, you look at Leviticus 23, 24, 25, Numbers 14, Exodus 12, all of these chapters cover dates and places that God deems different, and he deems it important because he knows if we do and observe those things and make them part of our ritual in life, you know, and these things repeat every year, those things to, seem to bear fruit on a, number of, on a number of levels. One of the levels... Um, is you discover that the fact that God is good. You, defect, you discover the fact that on a Shabbat, God deems it necessary that we stop. We put a, a full stop behind our sentences because our general society do not regard stopping. We worship being busy. We laud people for killing themselves with busy, busyness as if that is an honor. You know, we, we and 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 so the one thing that you discover in the rituals and in the patterns is that God is good. He actually wants us to stop. He actually wants us to eat out of His hand against the odds. He wants us to discover that God allows donkey, cattle, people, kings, slave, everybody to be treated with dignity that you can stop. And in the same way, when you look at the festivals, and all of the festivals contains bits and pieces that help us to understand the puzzle of what God is busy doing. So again, we have made, within the church and within the Greek thinking world, we've made a number of things important, which some of them has a biblical origin, but most of them really comes from the culture, from church culture. If you, by the way, I can recommend a great book by Frank Viola and George Barna called Pagan Christianity. that helps you to understand just where all of our strange uses come from. But God seems to be very much interested in teaching us patterns and repetitions that when we do them, uh, they seem to make us more healthy and more well. So if, if that is an answer, for example, in my own life, I have discovered the Shabbat at a 
young age of 30, that's it's, I'll give my age away, but it was about 12 years ago, I discovered the Shabbat, and, and I think over the last 12 years, I may have worked five days on the Shabbat, and I can honestly attest to you that those five days have been horrendous, and equally, the, since I've discovered the fact that God invites me to stop, there was, there was a certain sense of wellness that has come with that, Yeah. Not everybody needs to do it. I'm not going around preaching to people. They need, they need, if, if it's not your conviction, please don't do it. But this is what I discovered. And so, same thing with the festival. Same thing with eating more according to what God deems food versus eating stuff that God did not make us exactly. food. And then, you know, plaster it with a bunch of religious opinions of it. I'm not saying you need to do that, but I'm saying God is so practical and he's so functional. Mm -hmm. And he's just so interested in us being yeah. well. So, exactly. well, yeah, I, I've discovered that God is good through all of this. He's functional. He, he, I, I totally agree with what you were just saying. I have already seven years uh, practicing uh, God's word. Like what like you just mentioned, like observing the fees, observing uh, yeah. like the food that you eat, like eating kosher. Um, and uh, for my own experience, like to share with you guys, um, it's been definitely an experience, like uh, um, an, in another level. I mean, we, we, everybody here, I think, started at some point looking for God, and then they want to move out, move on, and move on. So, for my own experience, I feel like it's been revealing, uh, like finding God through His Word. Like I found, I found Him more. I already understand more about. Like the feast is more for prophetic reasons. Like for example, the spring that we have two seasons, the spring feast and we have the fall feast. So the spring feast is the feast that we know as Passover, uh, fresh first fruits, and and the in Shavuot, right? You, you guys know the, like Pentecost feast. Like that, those are the, the three of the beginning, and that's when the Messiah Yeshua um, he came. That's the word, those were the, the the season when when he died. And he accomplished the fulfillment of the prophet Isaiah when he came, when, when Yeshua came. And Isaiah was prophesied by the prophet Isaiah in, in chapter 53, around those. And, and basically is to remind how good is God, at the, like you just mentioned, like how good he is, is, is to send his own son and die for our sins. And then we can get, be part of Israel, be part of, of the God of Israel. Uh, everybody in the world. So I think uh, from my own experience, I, I every year remembering this amazing time when this, the <laughs> Messiah came. And also, like if we go now to the fall feast where we, we are heading now to the fall feast, it's also a prophetic meaning. It's basically, we know that the month, the month of history begins with the, with the Feast of Trumpet, which is when we blow the shofar. And, and it's like the, the coming back of the Lord. So he promised he will be back so we know that this is a uh, remembers that he will return one day and we, we have to get ready for the judgment. So when we, when we practice and observe God's feast and God's word, because that, that's in the Bible. So it's just that we have to take a look at it and observe it. And, and right now, like, like we just look in the month of Elul, like it's not to be idolater of the months of, of, but it's not, all, it's not at all. It's just to connect us like as a sign to, we use uh, in the Jewish, uh, in, the, in the, the Bible, it teaches that you have to look at the moon, at, at the signs of the heavens. So it's like appointment with God. So, so like the word modim, I don't know if you guys already um, talk about, but yeah, there's Hebrew words that connect uh, the meanings. And, and therefore, uh, we have to prepare for that time when the Lord comes back and we have to do the teshuva, which is return to God and repent for we everybody know what we have to deal and learn and, and try to fix. So Freddy, uh, for my before own you, being... Freddy, I'm going to interrupt you just because you're, you're now <laughs> mapping out what we're going to do for the next couple of weeks. So absolutely, oh, that's awesome. before you jump the gun. Sorry, I, that I, I jumped sorry, not, I'm not sorry. To, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is what we're going to be looking at. So we're going to break okay. it up into chewable chunks, slowly, yeah. small bite sizes. But thank you. Okay. We're going to look at this. So I, 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 I'm sorry. Yeah. Just sorry. one or two. No, no, not a problem. My electricity is going to go off. Oh. So I just wanted to say something for load shedding heads. Yes. Um, I think, um, 
it might be a little bit simpler in terms of the answer to your question originally. Um, and I agree with everything that you've said, but the verse that struck me is when Yeshua says, come to me all you are weary and burdened and I'll give you rest. Um, and I'm not sure if that's a translation issue, but when, but when he instructs us just to come to him and there you will find shalom, there you will find peace. He gives us rest. I think it's a lot simpler than, than that. You know, I think when you go to him and you have this continuous relationship with him, he slowly starts to unveil all the things that it is that we should be doing, you know? So it's really a walking in the Holy Spirit and um, Absolutely. finding the time to spend with him and going to him with your problems and, and looking to him for peace and looking to him for shalom um, mm -hmm. and not striving to gain it for yourself in some way because Amen. you yeah. won't ever get it for yourself if you're trying to observe so many things that it almost starts to feel like like you know that the rituals are things you have to strive for whereas when you go to him and it becomes an automatic response because of your relationship with him it no longer becomes a chore or a duty or you know a necessary thing in order to for approval i, I don't know if that makes sense <laughs> yeah absolutely remember this is i think i, I don't think i've made myself unclear on, on this platform this everything that we're doing studying the, the language of the ancients is to help us to understand Yeshua. I am I, I want to be clear about this in no uncertain terms. Um, none of what I say when God invites us into rhythms or patterns is meant to burden us. If it burdens you, I would say stop and go figure out why you think it burdens you. It may be that there is a way of thinking about this that is still burdensome. So you're absolutely right. The discovery of all of what God is doing is a discovery that in him is wellness. And in the person of Yeshua, that's why Paul calls him the mystery of God. Um, we have to discover that Christ is in everything. He is the end of everything. He is before everything. Amen. So if we can, if we can deal with that, it's a, and again, this is a lifelong, um, this is a lifelong journey. That's why we're invited into all these repetitions because we kind of see we seem to need a billion repetitions for us to discover that it is all about him you know but as long as it is about the the repetitions and about the rituals and it's it's that's what paul says those are only shadows you know because but into a relationship with me with with him like for me it was a um a situation of the closer i drew to him the easier it was for me to change my eating habits or observe certain days or want to actually give up the Sabbath and, and not work. It becomes mm -hmm. easy because you're seeking him. It's not really a case of doing those things in order to find him. Well, okay. So this, this is, a, this is a, like a whole, we could talk all evening about that because all you know that is this, um, describe the difference between Greek and Hebrew thinking. They're both, they're both right, by the way. <laughs> and so the, the Hebraic world is just, you discover the truth by obeying. You don't sit and say, once it makes sense, I'll do it. You know, that's kind of the Hebrew that I'll think about it. And if it makes sense, and if I can tick it off in my mind, then I'll, then I'll discover that it's a good thing. So it's, you're absolutely right. But the beauty is, it's, this is the, the is essential difference between Greek and Hebrew thinking. Hebrew thinking says, God talk, I do, and I discover the truth later. <laughs> Greek thinking says, even makes sense, I'll, uh, I'll do it. So, you, and both are right, by the way. Our whole culture, our, our entire world is Greek. We can't go being uh, all funny about it. But just to make, just a remark. And therefore, I, I find it beautiful to see, we are Greek, we are Greek thinkers. Let's not run away from that. And then let's not have moral high horses. <laughs> We're not Hebrew, even if you spend a billion years trying to be. <laughs> so you're hundred percent right. Okay. It's after eight. So we stop this uh, popcorn store. Somebody chatted here. Let me just see who's. Oh, I'm sharing it also on the trip. Oh, look at that. It's look at that. It's Africa. 
<laughs> I was just so funny. <laughs> yeah, Kirsty is gone. Chantal, you're in the dark. I'm just gonna say somebody. No, I'm, I'm still on. Chantal, huh? stay. Where does Chantal? Where do you live, Chantal? Just down the road. From Burskluf. But why is my electricity so on? This is so weird. <laughs> um, yeah. But don't, don't complain, you'll jinx it. No, not at all. <laughs> the light of Abba is shed abroad upon you. Oh my goodness, Gary, there you go. <laughs> don't, this feels like the rapture. <laughs> don't go, guys. <laughs> it's only going to be me that's left, I see. <laughs> um, yeah, other than... Uh, Ati, where's Ati? Is Ati still there? Ati, uh, I'm just reading your uh, deep uh, line here. It's be, yeah, basically participate as being representatives of Yahweh. Absolutely. This is this is what we're called to do. Absolutely. <laughs> thank you. But uh, everybody has seen that. Okay, thank you so much. Anybody else? Last comment for those who are, who are in darkness, those who can't speak to us. Gary, are you still there? Okay. <laughs> she's gone shame <laughs> okay okay everybody does it does it uh, did it help does it make sense is it uh